Oi, Haroldo. Hello, Anand. Tudo bem? How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm Thanks good. Thanks for the invitation. Ah, my pleasure. Uh, so, today my guest is my friend Haroldo Gambini Santos. He's a senior applied scientist at Amazon.com. For more than 10 years, he was a professor at the Computer Science Department of Universidade Federal de Ouro Preto in Brazil. In 2018 and 2019, he was a senior researcher at the Computer Science Department of KU Leuven in Belgium. His research focuses on algorithms and models for combinatorial optimization problems, and he has called for many papers published in prestigious journals such as EJOR, CNOR, OR Letters, Journal of Scheduling, and so on. In 2019, Haroldo won the Coin OR Cup Award for his contributions to the CBC Mixed Integer Linear Optimization Software. In 2012, his team won the second International Timetable Competition. From 2012 to 2020, he was a member of the Coin OR Foundation Technical Leadership Council. Haroldo, thank you so much for accepting the invitation. Uh, once again, it's a pleasure to have you here. My pleasure and, and great to be part of this project that I, I admire a lot. I'm a big fan of your podcast. Ah, thanks a lot. <laughs> so, Haroldo, uh, you were born in 1977. And because of your Brazilian accent, I know uh, you come from uh, Rio Grande do Sul uh, in the south of Brazil. But from which city? So, I came from a, a very small city, Júlio de Castilhos. Uh, the closest, bigger city is uh, Santa Maria, yeah. But uh, I come from Juiz de Castilhos. If it's a basically a city of farmers with 20k inhabitants. Ah, okay. Uh, I always thought you actually uh, came from Santa Maria because I know you studied there, but I had no idea you you, you were actually born and uh, and you probably grew up in, in Juiz de Castilhos, right? Uh, as you said. So until yeah, when? Until, until when? Mm -hmm, until when you lived in Júlio de Castilhos? Until I was 18 years old. Ah, okay. Uh, so what's your family background? So my father was a businessman. He had a small store, uh, and my mother was a physical education teacher on uh, elementary school. Ah, okay. Uh, I know you had a younger brother who sadly passed away uh, when uh, he was about nine, 14, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, were you influenced by your mom uh, to practice sports? Because, you know, she was a physical education teacher. She tried it without too much success. So I was really bad on most sports, including soccer, which is really popular in Brazil. But I, I did. I was a good skater for some time. Yeah. Oh, wow. Ah, and, and how about your dad? How did he influence you? Yeah, so my dad, in the 60s, he was uh, interested in electronics and uh, he learned how to fix TVs and uh, those things. Uh, never had a formal education, but was a very curious guy um, and he still is. And uh, then... Uh, in the 80s, when the microcomputers become accessible, he was really interested in that, and he was one of the first in the people in the city to buy, um, and and re really enjoyed science fiction. So uh, he read parts of uh, 2001: A Space Odyssey for me when I was a kid. Uh, so yes, uh, I think I was influenced by him. Uh, dreaming about thinking, really thinking computers and those things that now are more of uh, close to our reality. Ah, so you're fascinated by computers, right? Yeah, so uh, uh, as a child, uh, I had access to the computers he bought uh, in the 80s, so it was a small store. And uh, during the day, he used uh, this computer, uh, initially an 8-bit computer, uh, to basically process some commercial applications but after the store was closed i could i could start uh, playing with the computer some simple games and there was the l basic programming language that I, uh, at the time we had access to some magazines on uh, programming and microcomputers and then i became interested and uh, i wrote some small programs in basic 
back then. Uh, so when he saw that I was interested in this, he tried to encourage this. And uh, then we live it close to the border with Paraguay and computers were available there uh, much cheaper. So he smuggled uh, a personal computer, a, a, an XT PC, an IBM PC XT computer for me in the 80s. And uh, it was not exactly the computer that I wanted because uh, it was a good computer for commercial applications. But at that time, I was more interested in two games. So there were another 8-bit computers with more games in Brazil, like uh, MSX, which I recently bought one from uh, the Brazilian eBay equivalent. Wow. <laughs> so I have one today. Yep. Yeah, so you really like vintage computers then? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right now I had an, uh, I have to control myself to not buy more because some of them occupy a lot of space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. You mentioned that you coded in BASIC. Uh, how about other languages like Pascal and C? Yeah, so uh, in the end of the elementary school and uh, high school, uh, I found some colleagues with similar interests. And then we had like a programming club. Uh, and then we st I studied Pascal. I remember Pascal was uh, really a language that I fell in love immediately. I, the code is very clear. And uh, I wrote a lot of code in Pascal back then. And yeah, some of my my colleagues at the time they were really uh really good they one of them wrote a graphical version of uh, the war game wow uh, back then so yeah that there was no internet at the time but i believe that uh, <laughs> some of those games will will be appreciated today yeah absolutely uh so you have a degree in information systems right uh and why not computer science yeah, so that is interesting. So uh, when I finished high school, uh, it was uh, I was really not very prepared to go to university <laughs> because that was basically not the subject that I talked with my colleagues. <laughs> I had other interests at the time. And so the end result was that uh, I was not admitted in the best university in the region, which is uh, the most prestigious, which is uh, Federal de Santa Maria. Uh, then there was this course opening on uh, a smaller university in the region. Now it's a bigger one, but at the time... Is it a private one? Started. Yeah, a private one. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so the closest course to computer science that was available was uh, information system. Uh, and yeah, so that's why... Uh, uh, <laughs> that's the reason. Oh, okay. Uh, did you have to work to pay for your studies? Yes. Yeah, so uh, my family uh, was usually well prepared financially, but in the 90s, uh, there was a financial crisis in Brazil and it affected especially my family, the business of my father. So we were, we were basically broke in the 90s. Uh, and then uh, I had to work. To, uh, so uh, I were already coded. Uh, relatively well at the time. Uh, so I found some jobs on small jobs to write some commercial applications. Um, and so I worked it, but basically during the day and uh, did the college studies at night. Mm -hmm. And how challenging was for you to balance between study and work? Yeah, so uh, it was not easy because basically because I well, I don't. I don't think I was very mature at the time. So, uh, and so, for example, I uh, one thing that I remember is that I failed in statistics, uh, and that was really embarrassing for me because, you know, my parents were doing this effort to keep me studying in another city, and uh, ten years I lost a semester in one one class. So, fortunately, it didn't delay it for my graduation but I made sure a lot I think after that that uh, yes because of when I saw the effort that my parents were doing and uh, I realized that I really had to take it more seriously so yeah uh -huh. um, no or up to that point right no during the entire 
uh, uh, course that there was no OR classes and very few algorithm classes, for example, that was something that I was interested at the time. Mm -hmm. So when did your story with OR start? Yeah, so after I graduated, uh, there was a workshop on, at Federal de Santa Maria, this uh, university which is more famous in the region, and I uh, saw a talk by Philippe Miller at the time, where he talked about heuristics and optimization, combinatorial optimization problems, and which was something that I became interested. Uh, and then uh, I started to go to some classes, uh, not as a regular student, but they allowed me to, to, to add some classes. Uh, and then was the time that I knew, for example, one person you know, Olinto. Uh -huh. uh, he was also, uh, because at this time I had a job and uh, I uh, was really relatively well employed at the time for a single person. Um, and But I was interested in study more, especially computer science, as I mentioned. So I started to enroll in those courses at uh, this university. And uh, then I met Olinto, which was also employed at the time. He finished, had finished his master at the time, but he was very curious. And uh, so sometimes we were uh, the students that participate the most in the classes, even though we were not even enrolled sometimes, mm -hmm. <laughs> officially enrolled. Uh, and so it was a very good experience. We, uh, I studied uh, optimization, so we had some courses on linear programming and heuristics uh, and also distributed programming. Yeah, yeah. it was a, a good time. Very nice. You actually enrolled uh, yourself in a production engineering uh, program, right? It's, which is equivalent to industrial yeah. engineering, but in Brazil we refer to it as production engineering. And, yeah. and Olinto has been very influential on you, right? Yes. So at that time, uh, there were many students also for computer science, which were enrolled in the, the those optimization courses. Uh, and then it was interesting to me to see different approaches for solving problems. So, for example, some people, they really invested a lot of time on architecture and of design. Uh, and other people, like Olinto, for example, he was really interested in getting results quickly. Uh, so writing prototypes and, for example, he used MATLAB for scripts uh, and he also uses used uh, mathematical programming language like AMPL. Uh, and then uh, for me, it was really uh, very inspirational to see how important it is uh, in optimization to do experiments and to guide your research based on results of this experience instead of stay a long time planning which method to use, for example. Uh, the applied aspect uh, be became, uh, became very important to me after that, I think. Very nice. Olinto is such a nice guy. He's also very supportive uh, and, and he enjoys the subject of podcast too. So uh, yeah, yeah very nice. Yeah. Uh, you also met uh, another friend of ours in common, Luciana Buriol, who's now at Amazon and yeah. she was a subject to a guest too. Yeah, I have a list of Amazonians, which I su will suggest to you as guests also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Uh, so uh, tell me about your master's research project. Yeah, so at that time, uh, as I mentioned, I did some courses on parallel and distributed programming. So I basically wrote a, an architecture and some examples for heuristics, distributed optimization heuristics uh, and parallel heuristics. So, yeah. Did you call it MPI? We did some, we did study uh, MPI at that time, but in the end I used uh, Java and RMI, remote method invocation. Mm -hmm. uh, you also worked on parallel machine scheduling at the time, right? Yes, yes, we, we tested some uh, heuristics, I think that GRASP and local search based heuristics for this problem. Mm -hmm. But that was not uh, part of your master's dissertation. No, that, that was an interesting thing. So as I mentioned, I stayed one year watching some classes 
then I enrolled in the master program, uh, stayed two years. And after I finished it, I still did some research. This research in parallel machine schedule was uh, I made after finishing my master, for example. Mm -hmm. uh... in, in other words, I, it was I, w I was slow to start my PhD. I stayed, I stayed like four years. <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> four years. Yep. Yeah. OK. Uh, so it came to a point that Philippe Miller had to, you know, kick you out of. of yeah. the... <laughs> <laughs> Philippe is such a nice guy, too. He was uh, the president of a Brazilian Noir Society. He has supervised um, uh, not only you, but Luciana and other people. So very nice guy. Uh, yeah. So uh, why did you go to Universidade Federal Fluminense or UF for your PhD? Yeah, so, uh, so in 2002 uh, or 2001, yeah, 2002, I think, I, uh, there was this uh, operations research conference in Rio de Janeiro, which is, you know, it's an amazing city uh, in Brazil. Uh, and at that time, I was interested in uh, moving to uh, Rio de Janeiro because uh, you know, I became fascinated with the city and I was thinking on a PhD. And for me, that was a a, a good place to do a PhD. And uh, then I, I did some research on which were the options there. And we had at that time UFRJ uh, and UFI, for example. So I visit both with universities during this year. Uh, yeah, and I, for me, it was amazing. Uh, you know, the environment at UFI, for example, is mm -hmm. really great. Yeah. Uh, UFRJ is a very famous university, but, uh, uh, you know, it's a not uh, very, in a very calm region. Yeah, of very Rio accessible, Janeiro. like compared to, like, it's, a, it's located at Ilha do Governador. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, so I understand, right. Yeah, so that was the first time I went into an airplane. Ah. <laughs> so... 20 something years. Uh, and I, I prepared mostly the whole year to apply. So I was very anxious with the results of which university I would go if I would go. And uh, after some time, the results from UFAJ were published, and I was not in the accepted list, not in, nor in the not accepted list. So I called the secretary, and she told me that, hey, yeah, we know, you know, we really like it, your CV, but there was a problem. A professor took your CV home and he forgot to bring, so your application was not processed. So, no kidding. That's, yes. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, so they, I could, they, they would accept my uh, enrollment, but not with a scholarship, so that will not be an option. So, uh -huh. uh, but fortunately, at UF, they accepted me and they had a scholarship. So, yeah, then I started working with uh, Satoru, you know. Sure. Yeah. So your advisor was Luis Satoru Ochi, who was also my PhD advisor. Um, very welcoming uh, person. And I'm sure yeah. he, uh, he, he was uh, very supportive during your PhD. And uh, I mean, like he was to mine. And... Uh, was it easy uh, for you to quit your job to pursue a full-time PhD? Well, uh, definitely I was in a comfort zone in the sense that, yes, I was relatively well paid at the time. Uh, and But I, I really f uh, miss it, uh, studying more computer science, which is a passion for me. And so the PhD at UFI was computer science. That was a positive point for me. Uh, and one thing that I also missed was the possibility of being fully dedicated to studying for some time. Because as I mentioned, in, during graduation, I, I had to work. So uh, I was really looking forward to have some time to dedicate to studying and especially doing research. So uh, in the year, before starting my PhD, I started to search for topics to, to explore. And then I found uh, the thesis of uh, Marconi, 
which you know it's sure yeah one of my heroes great and my mentors. person yeah. yeah great person and researcher yes and then i discovered that were th these timetabling problems that were relatively small problems but really hard to solve and with a practical application uh, it was really hard to get the optimal solution for these problems and heuristics they didn't behave consistently also for this problem so uh yeah uh, uh, it, it it became a topic of interest to me and then i wrote the project satoru was very welcoming and yeah excellent you know that Marconi was not my advisor because we were in different universities when I was doing uh, when I was uh, doing my undergrad and masters. But he was a close friend of my uh, undergrad and master supervisor, Lucidio Cabral. And when I started, you know, really studying optimization, and he he immediately referred to his uh, notes on meta heuristics. And uh, I also had a chance to see his his thesis because I was working on a classroom assignment problem and he was working, he worked with time tabling and he had, he had experiences on, you know, this type of problems. Um, and we even collaborated and he wrote a recommendation letter for me when I applied for a PhD at UF. Uh, and I mean, we remain friends ever since. And he's one of my heroes, as I said, uh, uh, such a lovely person. And I mean, uh, he, he did a lot to our Brazilian community, right? Or the our community? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, has been very influential uh, uh, guy. And I mean, he deserves every, you know, credit uh, uh, for for everything he had done right for us. Um, so uh, you worked uh, with timetabling problems uh, in your PhD, as you said. Uh, but what were the main methodological contributions from your thesis? Yeah, so in my thesis, uh, uh, so in the first half, uh, I would say, of my thesis, I focus on heuristics. And then uh, we explored some meta heuristics. We, we tried uh, to use data mining for some to find patterns to improve uh, population based heuristics. Uh, that didn't work it very well at the time. Then we explored some variations of taboo search using different strategies for long term memory. And this worked quite well. Uh, for, for this first part, one thing that uh, I, I believe that uh, I learned at the time, and I tried to make it clear in the text, was the impact that uh, implementation has in the, the performance of the, the method. So uh, many times when people describe, especially heuristics and meta heuristics, they describe in a very high level. So depending on the implementation that you have, the performance may be completely different depending on the data structures you use. So uh, in my thesis, I tried to uh, discuss these things also, uh, which is the impact of different data structures for implementing and yeah. Uh, and on the second half of my thesis, uh, I focus on exacted methods. Then that was uh, the time that I knew Eduardo Shoa that you also uh, worked with yeah he was my co-advisor yes. <laughs> like you <laughs> yeah yeah we have very similar paths but in different times <laughs> yeah and you came from the <laughs> south and i came from the northeast region and uh we both studied in the same place and with a lot of people in common that's that's just fascinating <laughs> yeah so what what was your impression of working with eduardo shore yeah so uh talking about that as you know uh when I started to work with Edward Shaw, he was uh, not a long time he, as a professor. He was most basically starting at UF, I think. Mm -hmm. So he didn't have too many students at the time, uh, which for me was good because then I could have his attention. And he was extremely uh, optimistic about uh, the capabilities of integer programming and, and so this of solving exactly hard problems using integer programming. So that was really uh, motivating for me to work as a, as a student. But also, since I was really obsessed in solving these problems, sometimes I had to remember, hey, can, can we stop to take to drink some water, to drink some coffee? <laughs> <laughs> because, he, yeah, he, he could stay for hours discussing the topic. And, and he also had this... Uh, this way of working that previously when I discussed it with my advisors, 
they gave some ideas and and then i said okay i'll go home and, and try this idea and next week i'll show you the results with Eduardo, it was different uh, he he told me hey uh, what do you think about this and i say hey okay i will implement and i go home and implement it i said no let's try now <laughs> <laughs> we had a few hours to implement the method yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> I can totally relate. That's why I'm, I, I'm finding that very amusing. But yeah, so I, I remember one story now. Uh, I, I met at Wahadu Show. I, I actually saw him and spoke with him very briefly at the Brazilian Oil Conference in 2007. And now I remember that you uh, gave a short term course there with Marconi on timetabling. And the very first time I saw you, but I did not talk to you. Uh, is exactly when you were explaining, but I was actually attending the other short term course with Ushoa on uh, column generation. Uh, but then I saw you there, you know, it was, uh, I think you still had the little bit of hair uh, remaining at that time. <laughs> yeah, 10 years, yeah, more than 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's very interesting. So you see, I think we, we cross paths and, uh, uh, in our lives in, in a very uh, interesting way. Uh, uh, but uh, Aroldo, uh, when you were about to finish your PhD, uh, you got some devastating news uh, regarding your brother, right? Yeah, so uh, when I was in the uh, last year of my PhD, uh, I received the news that my, my brother, which is uh, really close to me, uh, had a aggressive brain cancer and uh, 10 Yes, we, I know that we didn't have too much time together, so uh, I immediately left Rio de Janeiro and went back to my city. Uh, and at this time, uh, I'm really thankful because uh, both Satoru and Eduardo were, they were really supportive for me. Then I could spend, I spent like six months in the hospital with him in the last months of uh, his life. It was, a, of course, a very difficult time, but uh, after that, uh, I was able to, to return and uh, then, yes, we could continue the research and it was good to be back. Uh, in, in some way, I think it helped me healing because, you know, uh, working with those problems that we have a chance to solve, that... Uh, it was really good for me, motivational at the time. And uh, then we still tried uh, many ideas. At that time, I was working more with uh, Eduardo because we were focused on the uh, exact methods part of my thesis. Uh, yes, then we, we managed to get some really good results with uh, column and cut generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think you told me once that uh those bounds you produced uh the, the lower bounds uh were actually uh optimal solutions but you had no idea at the time and you discovered only a decade later or something right yes yes so we uh we managed to get a, a formulation which was really good in terms of lower bounds uh it was not very good to produce primal feasible solutions uh but uh, the bounds the dual bounds were really strong uh, and at that time, we didn't knew too much because the heuristics couldn't reach the, those bounds. But like uh, 10 years after, uh, Eduardo called me and, and he, he was reviewing a paper and he said, yeah, you know, now we know that all the bounds are optimal because other heuristics had produced primal bounds which match it. So, yeah. Yeah, so we actually had a better method than you, you thought. Yeah. That's very nice. Uh, what did you do right after you finished your PhD? Yeah, so uh, when I finished my PhD, there was this company in Brazil, an optimization company, Gapsu, uh, that they were starting lots of projects uh, with uh, mining companies, Vale, you know, it's a big company, and Petrobras. Uh, and then there was this uh, team of researchers, uh, Marcos Poggi, Eduardo Shoa, that they uh, and even Arthur, Arthur, Arthur was not at the Gapsu. Yeah, Arthur was not at the Gapsu when I started, but he was part of the Gapsu from for some time. So very strong uh, team. <laughs> yeah, 
uh, all those people which, which are great researchers and with many contributions in interior programming, so you know the excellent work they have on vehicle routing uh, exact methods, uh -huh. they were starting the, this company and several projects, so they asked me to join. Uh, so, yeah, it was really an um, amazing work environment. Uh, at this company, I also worked with Cristiani, which is a, now an Amazonian and also my great friend for for a long time. Yeah, she comes uh, from the northeast region, uh, not so far yeah. from my state for Brazilian standards. <laughs> she comes from the state yeah. of uh, uh, Alagoas. <laughs> yeah, and uh, we worked in the same project for, for two years. It was really nice. Yeah. Uh, I remember that at that time, Aroldo, uh, you visited UF. I think it was around uh, 2009. And I had finally the chance to meet you in the corridor, uh, you know, right in front of, uh, of, um, of my office and next to your former office. <laughs> and uh, because you're next door, right? So, uh, so then I, I think we connected right away and you asked what I was, what, uh, I was doing. And I, I mentioned that I was working with VRPs, with heuristics and also with exact methods. And then you told that you were reviewing a, a paper for the Brazilian R conference uh, on the VRPTW and that the authors were storing routes during the search and then solving a cert partitioning formulation at the end of the algorithm uh, as an attempt to find the optimal combination of those routes that they store. Um, of course, that was not uh, an original idea uh, at the time. It was published during the 90s. Uh, but I was very inspired by that. And I immediately after our conversation, I think literally on the same day or on the very next day, I started coding. And I got fantastic results right away uh, 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 once I have implemented that. And I'm, I'm very grateful to you for that conversation because it, it had a tremendous impact on, on my research. So thank you very much. <laughs> Nice, nice, good to, to hear that. Yeah, I know that at that time I knew that you were a UF because of Marconi. He, he told me also that you were working with timetabling. Yeah. Yeah, in the, we work with class with an assignment problem, which is somewhat similar. We, we worked that before I started working on routing, but yeah. And also, um, I remember you, you told you were uh, working on uh, uh, the CBC and you were starting to collaborate with CoinOR. We're going to talk about that later. But I, I remember you also told me something about that. You were very enthusiastic about that. You're telling me, oh, the CLP is a very good uh, linear programming solver. And, uh, and that was nice. Um, so the period at Gapso did not last long. Uh, and you returned to academia, uh, more specifically yeah. to the Universidade Federal de Rio Preto. What, was there any particular reason behind that decision? Yeah, so in 2008, I went to the Patat conference, uh, which is a timetabling conference, and it was in Montreal at the time. Uh, and I, I realized that I was missing this environment because uh, for the previous two years, I was working on the, some industry problem. Uh, then, yeah, we were discussing solutions with a small group, uh, and then I went back to conference and I realized that I was missing the academic environment uh, at that time. Uh, at that time, I, I was also, as someone who came from the countryside, living in a small city, uh, I was a bit uh, tired of living in Rio. <laughs> uh, so I heard that there was a position for professor in Ouro Preto, which, you know, it's a small city also. Uh, with many nice people there that I already heard of, for example, Marconi uh, and uh, Tulu was someone that I heard also that was from there. Uh, so yes, I, I applied for professor in, in Ouro Preto and then went to back, went back to academia. Yeah, very nice. Ouro Preto is a fantastic historical city uh, in Brazil with a lot of slopes. I had the chance to visit the town uh, when you invited me to be part of the examination committee of Janielli for her master's work. Uh, and during that visit, I got the news that my PhD thesis received the Honorable Mention Award uh, from the Brazilian Ministry of Education. And you were the one who gave me the news when you were at a restaurant. 
so there you were again in an important mon moment of my life. You, I, I remember clearly you said, hey, congratulations. And I was kind of lost for a while because I was not expecting that at all. Uh, and then again, you were there. <laughs> You were, you were starting to become famous then, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I'm glad I heard the news first. Uh, that, was, that was nice, yeah. Uh, you were involved in the team that won the timetabling competition at Patat in, in 2012, correct? Yeah, so uh, during my thesis I worked with timetabling uh, uh, and I had some confidence that my, my algorithms were good, but you know, for timetabling back then was not uh, they didn't have a well-established set of instances uh, test instance uh, one reason was that different researchers from different countries they try different models with different particularities for each country different sets of constraints uh, the end result was that it was difficult to compare algorithms because they considered many variants of the problem uh, and then uh, in 2010, 2011, it started an effort to standardize those problems. So they created a language, which is XHSTT, uh, I think, uh, which is a XML basic basic language to express timetabling problems. And it, this language is relatively easy to express problems from different countries with different set of constraints. So. Uh, I was interested in testing my, my heuristics on, on, on this uh, more general problem, uh, not a so specific problem. So we, we formed a team in Ouro Preto. Uh, it was uh, included Marconi, Mar including Tulio, including George and Samuel, which are two brilliant students that I had. Uh, and then we tested many ideas and uh, we get some really good results. Yeah, we, and then uh, the prize was in, uh, the, uh, we accepted the prize in Norway, the, 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 the Patat 2012 in Oslo. Uh, that was when I met also a great person, you know, also is Grit Vandenberg, which is part of the Subject to Series yeah. also. Yeah, she's, she's fantastic. I like her very much. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, you also worked on Nurse Roastring. I'm saying that because she, she's an expert on the topic. Yeah, so we knew her that uh, uh, at the Patat conference, and we watched some presentations on nurse roastering, and they they did had a competition also in nurse roastering. Uh, I, I remember some time, but this competition we didn't participate. In. But after the competition, we started to test some uh, integer programming based methods for for uh, nurse roastering, and we got some really good results. And at this time, uh, I was also experimenting using the CoinWare MIP solver for this problem. Uh, we tried commercial solvers and we tried the CoinWare MIP solver. And then uh, it was really uh, interesting for me how deeper we could go doing research with open source solvers. Because uh, with commercial solvers, uh, you know, if the performance is great, uh, it's it can be hard to explain why the solver performed well because they do these automatic reformulations, pre-processing, and uh, the different heuristics. Of course, you can tune the parameters, but you never know exactly what happened inside the solver. Uh, and with open source solvers, you can really inspect step by step what is being done with your problem, which are the exact cuts that are being added, how the problem is being reformulated. So. Yeah, I became a, a. I was already interested in open source, but at this point, I became really a, a, an enthusiast mm -hmm. and a fan of uh, open source for uh, operations research software. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know that your code to uh, compute the CPU times uh, on Linux uh, passed from generation to generation at OOF, and I, I, I had access to that nice. code. Small library of functions. Yeah. <laughs> The, it was called Utils, right? Yeah, that, that, yeah. So, uh, you you made significant contributions to the Coinor project, uh, most notably on CBC. 
Could you highlight the most relevant uh, contributions? Yeah, so uh, I started with some small code uh, first to compute the MIP start, for example, if you, uh, because I use it that a lot. Uh, so we generate solutions heuristically and sometimes you want to start a, a provide this solution for the MIPS over so that he can continue and you, usually you don't have all the variables that the MIPS over needs, but MIPS over can compute those remaining variables. So I added the code for that. And at the same time, uh, one thing that uh, after my PhD, I, I, I was really interested in, in, in continuous studying was uh, combinatorial cuts for uh, time tabling and related problems because uh, I tested many types of cuts at the time and you know those rounding cuts they are can be problematic sometimes there are inaccuracies and combinatorial cuts are harder to find but when you find they work incredibly well so uh, I started uh, I think in in 2009 to, to do some research on improving the click cuts and improving odd wheels and odd cycle cuts for uh, problems with binary variables in general. Uh, and project scheduling also, we tried some related cuts and we tried to mix conflicts with the knapsack structure. Uh, and this project, we managed to organize in a set of routines that could be incorporated in, in CoinOware CBC. So we created code first to manage the conflict graph because you know the conflict graph between binary variables can be expensive, yes, uh, yes. Pro prohibitively expensive yes, to yes. store. Mm -hmm. uh, so many solvers, they just store a subset of this graph. Uh, so we created yeah, data structures and algorithms to store it efficient and compute. And then we use it this graph both in pre-processing and in cut generation phase. We started to, to try to use it for heuristics, but uh, this code didn't went too far. But so uh, this was a, a project that I worked for a long time and I was happy to have also collaborators who had the patience to work with me for a long time. <laughs> so, for example, uh, I, I was happy to met in 2009 uh, a student that was just starting a computer science course uh, Samuel. Uh, I think you know him. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. But he's a very talented yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then uh, he, he did, uh, he, I was his advisor for to graduate, 10 in the master and 10 in the PhD. And we basically continued the same type of work. And uh, after his PhD uh, with the, his contributions, we measured the performance of CBC. And even considering the very general set of instance of MIPLIB that you know, MIPLIB has lots of uh, uh, instance where the structure is uh, more general integers, not not necessarily only binary variables, so not easy to find too many combinatorial cuts. But even on the general MIPLIB instance, we could get an average speed up of 20% for CBC. Uh, and of course, for instance, with many binary variables, sometimes the speed up is huge, like from problems which could take days to solve can be solved in seconds if the, the conflict graph is dense enough. So. Yeah, that was a, a work that I was really proud. And, uh, yeah, it's fantastic yeah. work. Uh, and all your endeavors were recognized when you won the 2019 Coin Award Cup Award. Yeah, I, I think it was a, a great work. And as I mentioned, very thankful to uh, Samuel for having patience with work with me. <laughs> I, I also, uh, another student that they should mention that worked a long time with me was Janielli that you went mm -hmm. to his uh, master very smart uh, uh yeah student and, and, now... and she she worked with project scheduling and we also tried uh, project scheduling you know also a very hard problem and uh, there were many instances that were 20 years without being solved uh and then we managed to solve them for the first time uh and also the, the similarity with uh Samuel is that uh, I was his advisor both in master and PhD. So, uh, and that's uh, something that I believe that uh, uh, if you really want to make an impactful work, 
uh, insisting on, on, on some hard problem, it may pay off. So I like, uh, I don't give up easily. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you got inspiration from Eduardo Shoa, who... Yeah, <laughs> yeah Eduardo, Eduardo Shoa has uh, 20 years of experience <laughs> of CVRP and still getting better and better results. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly the inspiration. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's a role model in that regard, for sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you, you also had a chance to meet, you know, John Forrest, Ted Ralphs, right, uh, along the way. Yeah. Yeah, they're very important yeah. people in the CoinR project. Yeah, that, that was uh, really great for me, for example, to see uh, John Forrest, you know, it, it is a living legend. He pro proposed the Forrest Tony method in the 70s that's still really relevant. And uh, the SOS structure from Ips over the special order at sets. Uh, so, uh, and he was... Even after he retired, uh, he continued to, to, write, to write code, excellent code. So, for example, CLP, as you mentioned, the linear programming solver of uh, CoinWare. Uh, this is, I, I, I tested in many problems uh, back, then, back in the 2010s. And sometimes it was even faster than the commercial solvers. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so... Uh, it was really a, a pleasure to, to see. And, and that's the beauty of open source, that uh, even if you don't work in a big company, you can have access to very talented people if they want to discuss the contributions, if they want to review your work. So uh, I don't see a, a better way of uh, you know learning how to be involved in, in great software projects. Today for students at uh, open source, is, I think it's really a great opportunity. Yeah. And still talking about uh, open source software, uh, let's talk about PythonMip, uh, which has achieved almost 700,000 downloads so far. Uh, could you tell me the story behind its development? Tulio Toffolo, who, who's uh, also a co-creator of PythonMip, told me uh, already some spoiler, but I wanted to hear your, your version. Yeah, so, uh, so in 2018, uh they organized this workshop for coin art and uh, at the university of minnesota and they asked many people both from the coin art project and also for related projects so for example there were some people from the jump project which is the the operational research uh, package for julia language uh people from the Pyomo project uh, and we were discussing the, how the CoinWare project could evolve. And uh, one thing that everyone agreed at the time was that uh, even though CBC was a great MIP solver, for example, uh, it was not as used as it could be. Uh, and one reason was probably because the documentation is not great, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. to, to yeah. call the model uh, using CBC, uh, it's not so straightforward, I, I must confess. Uh, we have to, you know, use yeah. other alternatives. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then people were discussing how to make uh, our tools more popular. And uh, at the time, uh, you know, uh, I was really interested to see uh, the development of optimization tools with Python, for example, because Python is super expressive. So I, I saw the, the, the presentation of Pyomo, which you can have really a high level language like uh, AMPL. And Tulio showed me also the interface of Gurabi in Python. They are really practical. Uh, and I was also interested at the time in the jump project because the jump project, they offered uh, an interface for, for Julia. And also they combined the high level language, AMPL like with advanced features like uh, callbacks for cut generation. So that was something that was previously uh, not available. So previously we had like high level language. And if you need advanced features, you, you, you had to go to C, for example, code your optimization software in C. So this made things much more complicated. So uh, we were interested in, in having the, 
both things at the same uh, uh, package. And uh, Jump was a great option at the time, but you know, Julia is not a language as popular as Python. Uh, you have much less packages available. Uh, and uh, personally, I find Python Python code more beautiful. So uh, I learned at the time also that there were different ways of communicating Python with uh, C code. So there was a library CFFI where you can easily call C code, uh, even if without recompiling the C code, just call the DLL, the dynamic library. Uh, it was really practical and the performance was really good. So we started to play with the, this integration of Python and uh, optimization solvers. Uh, and then uh, we also observed that at the time uh, in the jump project, they related, they told us about some difficulties they were having. For example, they tried to support lots of solvers, but then it was getting really hard to maintain all these uh, solvers. Because if you really want to provide uh, a unified way of coding, uh, it's complicated. For example, Cplex has like 100 different error messages. And if if you want to really su support all the low level details, it's really hard if you support multiple solvers. So uh, we decided that it would be good to have a, a, a Python project that supported well CBC with good support for CBC. And if it supported commercial solver, it would be good, but uh, it will not be the main goal. So that's why we started Python MIP because we would like to give a relatively great support, uh, really a great support for CBC. And uh, we found that it was not hard to support CBC and Gurabi at the same time because they both had uh, many features in common. And you benefited uh, from the fact that you had access to CBC. I mean, uh, uh, you were you you knew yeah. what was going on, and that helped you to to you know write you know specific uh, codes even on CBC to support Python MIP, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yes. So at this time, I realized that uh, uh, I could improve the C interface of CBC really to add access to all features we want. So we implemented, for example, callbacks for cut generation, callbacks for heuristics. Uh, we implemented uh, SOS, the special order sets. And then uh, we also wanted to make sure that performance of Python Kali CBC was great. So basically uh, in, in Python MIP, uh, the wrapper is really a thin layer. So there's almost no overhead and we, we, we did a, use it a similar approach for, for uh, Gurabi, uh, try to write a very thin layer. And to our surprise, the inter, uh, the, our interface, Python MIP, uh, was much faster to, to, to create problem in Gurabi than the native Gurabi interface. <laughs> Probably wow. because of our approach to call directly the, the, the C library. Absolutely fantastic. Uh... What's the difference between Python MIP and other modeling tools like Pulp, Pyomo, or SciPy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Pulp, for example, uh, they have a really a great high level language, but they don't offer features like callbacks. For example, you cannot interact with the solver during the solution process. Uh, and they basically feed the solver and then get the results. Uh, so the they have the advantage, of course, that then you can support much more solvers because you don't need to know too much about the details on how it's being solved. Uh, so that was a difference that, uh, that we tried by design. We restrict ourselves to two solvers and then we try to make available all possible features that we could for those two solvers and also be sure that the performance for these two solvers will be, be great. Did you expect to get so many downloads? No, and uh, it was really uh, encouraging for me, the downloads, and I, I received messages. Like, for example, the first message I received was uh, a guy from Australia, and he told me, hey, we are using our tool here to organize for the Red Cross, the donation of blood across wow. Australia. 
Uh, so I was really happy to see that uh, they were using for very different purposes, for very different applications. So it was really rewarding. Yeah. And then in 2018 and 2019, you know, I was doing the postdoc at Belgium. Uh, so I was not teaching uh, at the time, so I had more time for coding. So, <laughs> and Tulio also was really motivated with the project. So we managed, we really did a lot of progress during those years. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. yeah, you took a sabbatical and that helped you boosting the development of, of Python MIP. Yeah, we teach Python MIP to our students, by the way. Uh, and we present that as the, 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 the Python solution to write models efficiently and, you know, calling CBC. Uh, so, so it's a very successful project. Uh, and are there many contributors to, to Python MIP? Yeah, so currently, uh, me and Tulio, for example, we are not heavily involved in the project uh, very occasionally, I can say. But uh, uh, they, they are maintaining the project. So Sebastian Hager is uh, regularly contributing. And they are also adding, for example, a new solver to Python MIP, which is Hikes. Mm. Uh, Hikes is an excellent uh, new linear programming solver and uh, now a MIP solver. So yeah, I hope that they, they yeah. continue. Long live Python MIP. I think it's a very interesting yeah. project and it should be kept alive. Uh, so uh, do you think that researchers who develop optimization software receive enough credit for their contribution? No, uh, I think that uh, there is very limited in incentive for people to uh, work on computational aspects of uh, optimization and to uh, work on open source software and optimization, for example. And uh, uh, we discussed also this topic in the CoinWare workshop, how to evaluate researchers who work with open source, we develop open source software. And I don't know if uh, at some point, for example, people could have like a just like we have an age index for publications, we have, if you could have similar metrics for people who write optimization software for research, and if it's used a lot, how can can get credit for it? But uh, my overall impression is that, uh, uh, yeah, the, there's not too much incentive, uh, besides, of course, being passionate and yeah. <laughs> about it. Sometimes you can publish a paper out of the software you develop, but then you don't have the like motivation to, to keep maintaining that, even to, to publish uh, additional papers out of it. It might be uh, hard and they may claim that's not that original. Uh, so yeah. so I, I think you were right. We, we should have some initiative that properly values uh, uh, this, this effort by the community and also encourages the community, I think. Uh, the more open source software we have, the more options we have, uh, the more progress we can make. So yeah. I think uh, we should find a way, I mean, the community in general should find a way to, to uh, encourage and to, to better appreciate the development of software, optimization software in our case, right? Yeah, and uh, you know, one, one person I, I admire a lot the work is uh, Matteo Fischetti, mm -hmm. uh, because he has really great contributions on uh, on not only on integer programming, integer programming theory itself, but also on computational methods, uh, methods that really made a big difference, like uh, uh, you know the local branching mm -hmm. and feasibility pump. Mm -hmm. Before those methods, uh, MIP solvers were really not very useful for practical applications because mm -hmm. it could take a long time even to generate feasible solutions, and. Uh, he says that, uh, he stated that, I remember at the conference, that uh, an algorithm without an implementation is like a theorem without a proof. And, and I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I believe that just proposing the algorithm and focusing on theoretical uh, Aspects. properties of the author, mm -hmm. it's important, but it's far from being everything. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that many times, uh, Algorithms that look great on theory, they may have several challenges to be implemented properly and do not behave well. We, we notice with uh, when we talk about cut, cutting planes, for example, uh, 
the limited precision has a huge impact and many people don't discuss that on, on papers and uh, when mm -hmm. you try to implement you can get completely wrong results if you don't yeah. do a very sophisticated implementation sometimes yeah i think we should give credit also to to people like david Pissinger for his uh, fantastic knapsack codes you know that had also a huge impact and you know things like that should be valued as we said uh Arodu, uh what made you leave academia and join amazon yeah so you know we had this common friend uh, Luciana Buriol, and in 2019, she did an internship at Amazon, uh, and she found the, the environment to be really great. And there was also Mauricio Rezende, which is a famous research, Brazilian also, mm -hmm. that uh, I met from time to time in conferences, and he was a uh, Amazonian also, and he explained me, well, what is the they had this large group working on operations research and logistics in general. So I was really motivated to uh, try again. I, I Maybe I got bored quickly, but <laughs> uh, I decided that was a good time to, to, to go to industry again. A lot of back and forth between industry and yeah. academia in your life. <laughs> Yeah, I know this is a hard question, but could you briefly comment about the projects that you're currently working on at Amazon or give a you know quick glance or overview? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, so I work on the R, science and tech. So, you know, Amazon has a cargo airline. Uh, ten, there are tons of logistic problems related to yeah, making good use of these expensive assets. Uh, and we have an amazing group so we have a uh, my uh, organization is inside mm pros which is the middle mile planning in general uh, so there are yeah many talented people uh, tulio is one of my colleagues and uh, and so it's a great environment to work and i started work in 2020 uh, initially remotely from brazil uh, so I moved to Washington State here in, in 2021, uh, but then it was they were still working remotely. Uh, so just recently, I got more taste of what is being working in office, uh, which is uh, been great because, as, as I mentioned, we have a great team. So uh, I do believe that collaborating more closely makes a difference. So I, I'm happy with this new phase. Right. Uh, what can we expect from you uh, in the coming years, or at least in the long-term future? <laughs> yeah, so who knows? Uh, <laughs> maybe I'll get bored and try new things later. But uh, right now, I'm still enjoying a lot the work environment and the problems that we're working. But uh, I definitely tried at some point in my career again to revisit some open source projects. Yeah, because it's, uh, this is really fun for me. Yeah, and how would you motivate people to come and uh, work uh, on open source software? I mean, uh, is is there a uh, a way that you think it might be efficient to you know give a, a, a you know an encouragement to the community to to make more uh, contributions and more fre frequently to those projects? Yeah, so I think that. Uh, that's uh, the good thing that everyone can contribute for. So, for example, even filling bug reports, if you do it a good way, if you provide all the details you can about what happened, then you can help a lot the project. And uh, as you, for example, as you provide feedback, uh, you interact with great people. As I mentioned, I work. At, I have the pleasure of working uh, with John Forrest on the CoinWire project, uh, and I learned a lot with this. So that's a big difference, I think, because in companies, you know, even inside the same company, you sometimes you have groups which work on different projects. So you don't know exactly what is going overall, but open source, which is open uh, by nature, then you really can go deep and know exactly what is happening, know the evolution of the project. So, yeah, I, I believe it's a great opportunity. Right. Haroldo, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it was wonderful to learn about your history and your views on several topics like uh, open source software, uh, especially those related to optimization um, and, and also uh, uh, how, how you dedicate yourself 
um, in that in that direction and also to learn about your contributions uh, related to the uh, CBC uh, solver. So many thanks. Muito obrigado. My pleasure, Jeff. Uh, looking forward for the next episodes also. Subject to thanks. Yeah. So I, I know uh, you you haven't been to Brazil uh, for a couple of years. Uh, if you manage to find time and visit João Pessoa, you still owe me a visit. Uh, I'll be very happy to host you around. <laughs> it will be great. I know you have a, a very productive and, and big group there. I, I, it would be great to talk with you guys. Yeah. Okay, Arodo. Take care and I hope to meet you soon. Ciao. Bye. You too. Bye.